Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Quentin. I work for Google. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Android virtualization team. And uh, today, uh, today I want to talk about uh, the work we've done on protected KVM on NORM64. Uh, so, so PKVM, as we, as we call it, is, uh, you know, is, has been mentioned, I think, several times during the conference. Uh, so hopefully by now, most of you should have at least a rough idea of what PKVM is about. But if you don't, um, the idea of PKVM is it's basically an extension of KVM for ARM64 that provides um, confidential computing features, uh, even on CPUs that don't necessarily have additional fancy hardware support for it. So PKVM is, is to some degree comparable with, with TDX or, or SEV, for instance, in terms of what it tries to achieve. It's all about protecting guest memory from the host, but it's quite different from, from, from TDX or SEV in how it achieves that. And it's precisely the how we make that happen that I want to talk about today. So why talk about PKVM? So first of all, I think it's, I think it's pretty cool. Um, it is a slightly biased opinion, obviously, so I'll let you decide. Uh, but it's also the first birthday of the code, so it felt like a good time to look back and, and see all the, the things we've done over the last year. I'm also hoping that this talk will be inspiring to other architectures. And in fact, you know, I have seen that some of the concepts that we have, uh, you know, came up with for PKVM have already been inspiring for other architectures. So I'm hoping that this will help even more. And, and finally, we have a relatively large patch series out there, which implements uh, most of the things I'm going to, to discuss. And so I'm hoping that, you know, this, this talk may bring some color and maybe help a little bit the review of this patch series, which is, which is quite big. And there are still open discuss discussion points that I would like to, to discuss as well. So quick disclaimer, uh, as opposed to the previous talk, this very much intends to be a technical talk. So here's the cake if you were waiting for it. Um, what this means is I'm not going to be talking too much about why we're doing any of this, why Android is interested in confidential computing or things like that, but I'll be talking about what we actually do and how we make that happen. If you are interested in those things, though, please feel free to reach out at the end of the talk. And there are also uh, resources that I've listed here uh, on the slides. The slides themselves have quite a bit. I'll try and cover as much material as I can. Uh, uh, but yeah, hopefully they, they can be useful as a, as a future reference as well. So. PKVM. The first thing I've said is PKVM is an extension of KVM for ARM64. So before I can explain how we extend it, I think it makes sense to start by talking about how PKVM works in the first place. Uh, in this picture, I'm showing uh, the uh, KVM setup for the so-called NVHE execution mode of, of KVM. We have two different modes of execution for on ARM64. I will be focusing on the NVHE part today just because it's the one that is relevant to PKVM. So as you can see, the, the ARM architecture defines multiple exception levels. So exception level zero, which is typically where user space runs. EL1 is for the, the, the kernel layer. EL2 is the hypervisor layer. There is also an EL3 that is defined in the architecture for the firmware layer, but I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, so on the left side, we have the host user space and on the right side, the guest user space. The one interesting thing to notice with this setup here is that the host Linux kernel is running at the L1 and not at the hypervisor layer, which means that KVM itself does not have directly access to virtualization features. The way we enable virtualization of guests is by having a separate piece of code running at EL2, which we call the KVM world switch code, which as the name suggests, is about, you know, is, is, is meant to context switch between host context and guest context. The KVM world switch code is part of Linux, technically. It is in the Linux source code. Uh, it is built into Linux, linked into the, 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 the image, but placed into a different section of the L file. And it is essentially left behind uh, during boot. Uh, and and it, just, it is just responsible, essentially, for context switching, context switching to guests when the host requests it. Another, another thing to notice here is that when, when we're running on guest context, uh, we have the stage two translation, which is enabled. Uh, the stage two MMU is in, in the ARM world, how we do the, the guest physical address to host physical address translation in the hardware. And interestingly, the, the host doesn't have a stage two MMU on uh, when it's running, which means that the host has access by default in normal KVM, non-PKVM. The host has access to all of memory, 
which includes guest memory as well as hypervisor memory. Uh, with PKVM, we are basically using this somewhat uh, unusual or odd uh, setup to our advantage, and we are basically extending the EL2 component that sits at the bottom of the picture here, and we're making this hypervisor code a little bit smarter, and we're giving it the ability to uh, enable the stage two translation even when the host is running, which puts the hypervisor in a position to enforce access control restriction to pages, arbitrary pages in the system. And it can, thanks to this, prevent the host kernel from accessing guest memory or accessing uh, hypervisor memory. The reason why we've designed PKVM as an extension of, K of the NVHE uh, uh, mode like this is because this means we can have the hypervisor and the kernel in the same image, which has a few different benefits. First, it's great for updatability. Uh, in the Android world, we've put a lot of efforts into kernel updatability, deploying updated kernels to devices on the field. We don't want to just reinvent the wheel for the hypervisor. So if we can just have the hypervisor package with the kernel, we'll get that for free. Uh, since the hypervisor and the kernel are part of the same image and they are by construction updated atomically, which means we don't have to keep a stable ABI between the host kernel and the hypervisor. And that gives us a great deal of flexibility to invent whatever you know, mechanism we can, we can come up with uh, without having to fear for backward compatibility. And finally, the hypervisor, the hypervisor is open source. So it's, it's quite a nice thing to know that the code that's running at high privilege level on your system is something that you can look at, fix, audit, improve. We can come up with any sort of feature, security feature or hardening on top of it, and the community can, can you know, we benefit from all of that. So, I mean, this is all great, but how, how, you know, how does it actually work? In order to do that, I would like to introduce you to your uh, best friend for the next 25 minutes, which is this little character in the bottom left corner. Uh, this will represent our user. And what I would like to suggest is that we follow that user as they interact with their device. And we'll make a few stops along the way and look at how PKVM gets involved in the in interaction of the user with the device. And a few different places will take a small tangent to talk about interesting things that Hypervisor does as well. The first thing that our user will do is to simply just power the device on and put the device. The PKVM story, I would say, uh, starts pretty early when we boot the device. We have the expectation that the bootloader will be responsible for checking that the boot image that is loaded in the device is effectively the one that the vendor intended to load using signature checking, you know, all of the industry standard things. The kernel must be entered by the bootloader at EL2. That's a requirement for KVM on ARM in general, not just PKVM. And one of the very, very first things that a kernel will do when it is entered at ER2, when I mean one of the first things is like in the first maybe 20 instructions or something, uh, it, will, it will detect that it is running at ER2, install what we call the stub vectors, the exception vectors at ER2, which are dummy exception vectors basically, which do nothing, and then ERET to ER1 and proceed to boot from there. A little bit later, uh, we'll, we'll hit the point where we set up the memory management subsystem in Linux. Uh, and the hypervisor is going to need some memory for itself in order to manage a few different things, including its page table, its own set of stage one page table, as well as the page table of the host. It's going to require memory for that. And so the current implementation that we have uh, sort of uh, uses the memblock API fairly early on to allocate a pool of memory that will be donated to the hypervisor later on. And the, the, the amount of memory that we have to reserve is a function of uh, you know, how much memory there is on your system because the page tables, you know, the size of the page tables depend on that. Later on, when PKVM initializes, and um, I should mention on, on ARM, PKVM, uh, sorry, KVM is not modular. So we, we cannot load it as a module. It has to be built into the kernel. So this happens before we reach user space. Uh, when, when we reach the point where, P, where KVM uh, tries to initialize, in the context of PKVM, we have to do an additional, a few additional steps. So we, have, we expect the host to allocate a temporary uh, stage one page table for the hypervisor, which will come handy when we, start to, when we want to initialize the hypervisor because we can use that page table to turn the MMU on immediately, which is, which is uh, really, really useful to bootstrap the hypervisor. And host allocates a few more things, such as the stacks for, for ER2 and, and per CPU pages. 
and then it, it will issue a hypo call to EL2, which will uh, replace the dummy stub vectors that we have installed, replace them with the PKVM stub vectors, and then the hypervisor can start uh, sort of bootstrapping itself. Uh, first, it will recreate its own stage one page table using the pages that have been reserved in the memory pool I mentioned earlier. And it will also initialize the stage two page table for the host and unmap itself from the host stage two. So it will unmap, will unmap the text section of the hypervisor data section as well as the, the memory pool type that I've mentioned uh, earlier. And from that point, the hypervisor will return to the host, which will proceed to boot as if nothing happened except that at that point now, the stage two page table of the host is enabled. And it, in fact, the host is no longer able to access certain pages in the system, specifically uh, the hypervisor pages, which makes our little friend here really happy. Before we get back to our little user and see what, what he's going to do next, I would like to take the opportunity. I would like to focus on something that I've mentioned here. Uh, I've explained that the, the hypervisor will map itself using the stage one page table and unmap itself from the host stage two. Conceptually, this means that the hypervisor is effectively taking ownership of those memory pages. Uh, in, the, in the context of PKVM, it's the hypervisor's responsibility to track which pages are owned by which entity in the system at any point in time and enforce the, the access control restrictions that are required. Uh, and we have to some extent formalize this in, in the context of PKVM. So I just want to spend a few minutes to talk about memory ownership tracking. Uh, PKVM says several possible types of owners for memory. Uh, so the host may be one, uh, owning memory, the hypervisor may be owning memory, guest VMs when they are protected may be owning memory. There are potentially other entities, not going to describe them too much, but you can think about trust zone and things like this. Uh, and from the point of view of each of these owners, the pages in the system can be, can be in, either of, in one of four states. Either the page is completely owned by that entity, which implies that whoever is the owner has exclusive, exclusive access to the page, or the page can be shared. And you can either be the, uh, the, the, the provider of the, of, the, of the share or the recipient uh, or the borrower in, in this case. And finally, we have a state to imply that the page is no longer accessible, uh, which is what happens, for instance, when we unmap something from the host. Um, the, the, the way we track ownership is, uh, you know, is implemented at the page table level itself. The hypervisor maintains the page tables for I mean, its own page table, as well as the guest page tables and the host page table. To see which pages are owned by who and shared with who, we use uh, software bits in the page table entries so we have four, four bits uh, defined in the M architecture that are reserved for software use. We use them exactly for that. We have sort of restricted sharing to only be sort of a peer-to-peer -peer thing for now, uh, for simplicity. So we don't allow n-way sharing where you will have three or more entities sharing a page. That's for simplicity reason. Uh, and I mean, n-way sharing has, has its own set of problems. So this, we, we've simply started simple. An interesting thing to say as well is that the host stage two page table is identity mapped. So we never use translation. We only use access control restrictions for mapping memory in, into the host stage two. And that lets us do some interesting things. When we, uh, there is an invalid page table entry into the host page table, and if bit, so if bit zero is clear, it means that bit one to 63 will be completely ignored by the hardware. So we reuse them to store metadata about the pages. And specifically what we do in this case is we store the owner ID of whoever is the owner of the page that corresponds to, 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 the, to, to the mapping. We've defined the host identifier to be zero, such that basically if you have a PTE in the host stage two that is just completely zero, this encodes ownership to the host. Um, now that we've defined the state, uh, we have also sort of formalized the way we can do uh, conversions or you know, uh, we can transition from one state to another, uh, donation of pages. Uh, all, I mean, all of those tra transitions happen in two steps. We first check that we have a certain invariant that is correct into the page table of the initiator of the transition and the completer of the transition, and then apply the, the, the changes to the page table. For donations, we expect that the initiator of the transition has exclusive, exclusive access to the page that is being donated. And obviously, uh, it's sort of implied that the completer doesn't have access to it and then apply this. I'd like to uh, uh, emphasize here that we don't accept a donation for a page that is shared. For instance, we don't have 
like transitive sharing or anything of, of, of that thing, before a page can be donated to someone, it has to be unshared first to reclaim, to, to, get, to get back exclusive ownership. Uh, sharing a page, we have the same initial state, but obviously we will go uh, and map pages in both page tables with the, uh, the, the, the appropriate mappings in the, the page table linked to the software bits. And the unshare, obviously, is the reverse operation. Um, all right, so now that you know everything there is to know about uh, memory ownership tracking in PKVM, we can, we can go one step further. So our user has been able to boot the device, and now we said, oh, it's great, I have a PKVM-enabled device. I should try and create a guest, and well, that's what, that's what we'll be doing. When, when, uh, when we're creating a guest with PKVM, the host has a few extra, se extra steps to do. First, it needs to allocate uh, more memory, and you will see that this is actually a common theme uh, every time we need to do something with the hypervisor, one of the first things we have to do is allocate memory that we're going to donate to it. We are running the hypervisor with as little memory as we possibly can, and we donate, we donate memory dynamically to it and reclaim it when, when that's possible as well. So the host will allocate memory and then issue a hypercall to, to tell the hypervisor, please, I would like to create a guest and here are the pages you can use in order to store the metadata for that VM. The hypervisor in that case will convert all of those allocated pages to uh, you know, hypervisor private memory with a host to hypervisor donation, as I've just described. And then it will allocate uh, what we call a shadow handle uh, and then initialize all of the ER2 private data structures, which include a struct KVM and a struct vCPU for each vCPU as well as the root of the, of the page table, uh, and then return that handle back to the host. The handle that the, allocator, the, the hypervisor has allocated is what the, the, the host can then use in order to talk to the hypervisor when it, when it talks about that VM. So it's comparable to the, to the VMFD that user space has when you create a VM with, with an IL tool. Uh, maybe one, one point to make. So a lot of the initial patch series we've posted used the, the, the notion of shadow data structures. Uh, I think we're in the process of renaming those data structures to, to not be called shadows anymore. So I think this might even be um, uh, sort of uh, out of date, out of this morning, because I think Will has posted in the past series. Um, the, 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 shadow, the shadow terminology is consistent with the, the series at the time where I, I, was, um, uh, I wrote the slide. So this is basically what, we, what it looks like. When, when the host uh, creates a guest, first it will allocate its own KVM uh, struct, KVM struct vCPU, and all of that stuff. And one of the members in struct KVM into the arch code will be the shadow handle. Once he, the EL1 has asked the hypervisor to create those things, the hypervisor will have its own private copies, well, not copies, but those its own private instances of uh, uh, you know, similar data structures with the, what we call the KVM shadow VM, which includes a struct KVM plus a few other things, and same thing for the vCPUs. Uh, one of the things that the hypervisor has as well is a back point to the, to the host data structures. Um, as I've explained earlier, we are running the hypervisor with as little memory as we possibly can. And in fact, the, the whole hypervisor runs at EL2 in a fairly constrained and limited environment. We can't just run kernel code, it's a separate exception level. Uh, and it, it, EL2 was I and mean, is a fairly restricted place where you can run code. But over the years, we've been, I mean, over the last year, uh, essentially, we've been adding infra infrastructure to, to the hypervisor to try and make our life a little bit easier. And most of the, the things that we've, added, uh, that we've added are concepts borrowed from the kernel. And the idea is really to, you know, if you're a kernel hacker, you should somewhat feel at home when you're working with, with the EL2 layer. So we have spin locks. We don't have mutexes because the hypervisor is completely non-preemptible. That's a hard constraint. We have debug features, which allow us to, to assert that certain locks are held in certain places. We have a page allocator. It's quite limited in how it can be used, uh, just because we have very, very limited memory constraints. We have third first infrastructure. We have a VMAP map uh, as well. It's, we have a struct high page, which is really, really small, but it's quite convenient for, for some things. Uh, and we're working on, on interfacing with the host uh, uh, tracing subsystem as well to have the hypervisor emit trace events into the, into the host trace buffer, all of those sort of things. So this is, there, there's a lot of things we can already, already do at the L2. All right, so we have booted the device, created the guest, now it's time to run it. So KVM 
has uh, the notion of uh, vCPU load and vCPU put. The idea of vCPU load and vCPU put, vCPU put is to make the a vCPU essentially resident on a physical CPU as a way to optimize the, the vCPU run loop. Uh, PKVM uses a similar model. We have uh, hyper calls for vCPU load and vCPU put, but there is a little bit of added semantic on top of that. In the context of when, when the host tries to issue a vCPU load hypercall, the hypervisor will have to do a number of, well, a, a few security and sort of sanity checks before it will allow that to happen. For instance, it must make sure that that vCPU is not currently loaded somewhere else, or that that vCPU, we don't already have a vCPU loaded on, on the physical CPU, uh, uh, these type of things. And then subsequent hypercalls, such as vCPU run, will require that the vCPU has been loaded before. And, and this, is, this will be a strong uh, hard requirement. And vCPU put, when we you know, release the reference we have on the, on, the, on the vCPU, will sync what we call sync the vCPU shadow, shadow state with the, with the host for non-protected VM. And we'll drop the reference and then clear the, the sort of EL2 tracking we have, the per CPU tracking we have to, to track the, the loaded vCPUs. Just to talk about SIG and FLUSH quickly, these are our names that were traditionally used in KVM uh, ARM. It may, they may not be used for, I mean, clear to, to everyone. So the idea of uh, the sync is going from the EL2 state back to the EL1 copy, which typically happens after we've run the vCPU and we want to copy part of the state back into the host so it can handle a fault, for instance, and sync and flush it the other way around. Um, so, Okay, we've loaded the vCPU, now it's time to run it. The vCPU run hypercall uh, in the context of PKVM takes essentially no parameters because vCPU run expects that the vCPU that we want to load is already uh, loaded on the physical CPU. So whatever is passed as a parameter will be, will be um, ignored. In this case, the hypervisor will flush part of the vCPU state, which means it, might, it will copy a very small, it will cherry pick a very small part of the of the, the vCPU state that's coming from the host that it believes can be trusted or is you know, not, not going to cause security problem. And then context switch to the, to the guest but using the EL2 copy of the vCPU and then iterate into that guest. When we exit back, then the, the host will sync part of the state, which means copy back some of the state from, from the shadow vCPU stripe back to the host. Um, when the guest exits, there are some things we can handle at EL2 directly. Um, for instance, the, the FP state uh, is switched between the, the host and guest transparently, uh, so, sorry, lazily. So this is kind of, a, kind of things we can do directly. We've, we have some, some logic for, for the big stuff that can be done as well. But it's more the exception than the rule. Most of the exits have to be handled by the host. Uh, and, and in fact, because the host still have its own KVM struct and vCPU struct, and we only populate the state that we care about into that thing, most of the host side handling is effectively unmodified with PKVM. It's just very similar to, to normal KVM. One notable exception, however, is memory airboards. So let's imagine that we are, that we are running a TL2. We have a guest that is exiting, and we, just re we manage to handle that exit every time and re-enter the guest. At some point, we'll get a data abort or an instruction abort coming from the guest. What the hypervisor will do in this case is copy the, the ESR, which is the exception syndrome register, uh, and the GPA. It will copy that back into the, the host uh, vCPU struct and then return to EL1 saying, please handle the fault for me. Um, as with traditional KVM, we, we will expect, you know, we'll look up the mem slot and convert the, the, uh, the GPA into an HVA. And in the current implementation that we have, instead of just doing a GUP and mapping things into the guest, uh, we will have KVM take a long-term gap pin on the page that is returned, uh, that, it, that is found uh, on the HVA page. Uh, the reason we take a long-term gap pin is to prevent uh, swap and page migration because we are about to, to donate that page to the guest and lose access to it. So we don't want KSM or whatever uh, to mess with it. I'll, I'll talk about uh, a bit more about that later. Uh, once that is done, uh, we need to have KVM top up a per vCPU memcache, similar to, uh, to what we already do with the MMU cache, and then uh, issue a PKVM guest map hypercall. At that point, the hypervisor will try and top up its own vCPU memcache from the memcache that the host has provided. 
that every time we will take a page out of the host main cache and into our own main cache, into the hypervisor main cache, we have to go through a full host to hypervisor donation to make sure we, we have the right environments in place. Once the hypervisor has enough memory into its mem cache to create the guest mappings, it will go and modify the guest stage two page table. For protected guests, all of the, the, the pages will be donated completely to the guests. So we'll also unmap from the host. For non-protected guests, so traditional KVM guests, we'll just do a share and keep the mapping, uh, we'll retain the mapping in the host stage two as well. Once that is done, we can then return to the host, to, uh, which, which can proceed to run the VCV or run hypercall and rinse repeat. Um, I've mentioned how we handle memory abort. Uh, that doesn't tell us how we do MMIO exits. There are a few problems uh, with that, which, which require some additional work. Uh, one of the things is that the hypervisor has no understanding of mem slots. We just don't have that concept at all at ER2 right now. And for I think fairly obvious confidentiality reasons, the guest registers are not copied back to the to the host kernel when we exit the VCPU. So it makes MMIO handling uh, I mean a little bit complicated. So we uh, had to expose from the hypervisor a set of hypercalls to guests uh, to allow them to declare their MMIO ranges basically. So a guest can issue the hypercall to say, I'm willing the host to handle MMIO for me in this region of my IPA space or GPA space. And then the hypervisor, when it says exit in those regions, it will use the, the, the R0, or X0, sorry, as a transfer register. Um, in, in a similar idea, uh, we have also exposed to guests share hypercalls, which allows the guest essentially to share pages, like protected guests to share pages back to uh, with the host to allow communications, so typically a dot IO communications and things like that. Uh, it is a little bit interesting in some cases because all of guest memory is paged in lazily, which means that the guest may try to share a page that it doesn't actually have. Uh, in that case, we, we need to have the hypervisor, essentially, we have the hypervisor um, uh, fudge the, the, the exception syndrome register before it returns to, to, the, to the host to pretend that this is in fact a data about from the guest to trigger the fault handling path on, into, the, into the host, get the host to donate the page and then replay the, the AVC on the guest side on the next VCPU run. A few notes on how we load things into the guest because it's, it ties into how memory gets mapped in, 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 into there. Um, the, the expectations we currently have is that the, the device bootloader, which is the Android bootloader for us, uh, has to copy a uh, trusted guest bootloader into a reserved memory region, which will be described into DT of the host. And that memory region will then be unmapped by the hypervisor when it initializes. So when I said earlier that the hypervisor unmaps itself from the host, it also unmaps the guest bootloader. And the, the VMM can then uh, specify when it creates a guest, I want the bootloader to be loaded at this particular region of the guest IPA or IBA space. And uh, the first time the VCPU is run, the, we, we run the guest, we will force the, the program counter of the guest to be into those regions to fold 10 pages in that, into that range. And as the hypervisor will see those pages being donated by the host, it will copy the guest bootloader into the guest, which can then proceed to load the guest payload and attest that whatever is being loaded into the protected guest is what it is expected. Um, so I've, I've been talking about guests a lot, uh, but the interesting thing with PKVM is we have not only to handle guest faults, but also host stage two faults, because this might happen. In, in the implementation, we have the host stage two mappings are created lazily, just like they are for guests, essentially. And every time we take a fault, a fault at TR2 because of a stage two, uh, stage two fault, we have to check the state of the page by walking the host stage two page tables. If we find that uh, the PTE that corresponds to the, to, to, to the address we're trying to, 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 to access uh, is invalid, we will check bits 1 to CT3, as I've mentioned earlier, to see we, who is the owner of that page. If the owner of that page happens to be the host, we can just create a valid mapping and replay. If the PTE is valid, that we found, it probably means we just rate with someone else who has done that for us just before, so we can just re-enter the host and hope for the best. But if with the PTE is invalid and the ID we found in the, in the remaining bits 
is not the one of the host, then we have a problem. It means we've caught the host accessing private memory, and this is where the fun begins. Yeah. Um, so the, the handling that we have implemented in the, in the current in PKVM is, is, is basically that we have the hypervisor just re-inject the exception back into the host and have the host handle it. Um, if, the fault, if the fault was taken from EL0, it means that it was user space that, was, that accessed pages uh, that, are, that have been donated to a guest. So that's typically going to be the VMM that still has a mapping on the page that has been, done, that has been donated. It tries to access that, and obviously something has to be done. In that case, the, the hypervisor will just re-inject the exception back into the host uh, and, and, and set an additional bit into the exception center and register to make sure that the host handler can distinguish that exception from just a normal like EL0 paging fault. When, when we see that at uh, EL1 in the host kernel, we'll say, oh, the hypervisor is telling me that that guest has been accessing memory, it shouldn't, uh, and I don't really don't know what to do, so I'll just take be the user space process that, that did that. If the fault was taken from EL1, however, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, in this case, we have the hypervisor sort of repaint the exception syndrome register to pretend that the fault we've taken is a, is a, is a same level fault and then re-enter the kernel saying, there you go, you, you, you've, create, you've caused yourself to enter the exception handler, Do, deal with it. There are cases where the kernel can handle same level faults, but not that many. So for instance, if, uh, let's imagine that we have a compromised user space, a compromised VMM or a malicious VMM, for instance, that tries to do a syscall and it passes as parameter to that syscall memory that belongs to a protected guest. In that case, the kernel will access that memory uh, in using copy to user, copy from user, and, and things like this, which means that we will be in position to handle the same level fault and actually just fail the syscall. But if you take the same example and have a process S trace, this malicious VMM, then the S trace process will try and inspect whatever memory is being passed to the to the to the to the system call, and it will do that using uh, the I have an example here using the process VM read V syscall, which will do uh, get user pages remote, if our memory is correct, and then access those pages through the linear map. In that case, the hypervisor will say, okay, you can't access that, those pages. We'll re-enter the kernel, but we're not in a position to, uh, to actually handle the fault. We'll just have to bring the machine down. This is, in my opinion, the biggest remaining problem with the host side implementation of PKVM. I think the hypervisor is now getting pretty solid, but there is still work that needs to be done <coughs> on that front before we can, we can land this upstream. One promising solution to that problem would be to extend the, the private FD proposal that, that came from the, the TDX, uh, I think it's the TDX developers. Uh, it has a lot of good features for what we're trying to do here. It should prevent uh, swap and page migration, and it should if, if, it, if done correctly, prevent the kernel from accessing guest memory through sort of side, uh, side things, and also offers potentially a suitable API uh, in order to implement hypervisor-assisted page migration data. Uh, however, we really need to have support for, for what we call in-place conversions, which means non-destructive shares or, or, or unshares or donations. Uh, another thing we're currently looking at is whether secret mem would, would be actually a good uh, option for this, because we don't necessarily mind keeping guest memory mapped into the VMM as long as only the VMM can access those pages because we can say we like cleanly if that happens. Uh, the biggest problem is when the kernel ha accesses those, those pages, so maybe secret mem extended with some of the features uh, provided by the private FD proposal would be a good option. Another possibility, but which is not so promising, would be to have the hypervisor just kill the guest. Um, that is, slightly ugly, but it should work. <laughs> um, the, the idea would be that, you know, the hypervisor, when it sees that, uh, you know, the, the, the host access make, uh, the guest memory, it kills the guest, poison all of it, and returns it to the, to the host, and just let the host write or read the poison values, and essentially just proceed and not fail. Um, one of the pros is that it means we can just keep our long-term gap in thing working and we don't have to do any changes from the on the core MM side, essentially. The problem is it's quite a bit of complexity that is added at the L2 
I think the guest being blamed for something it, it's not responsible for is not necessarily the cleanest option. And it also means that potentially KVM will, ha will be made aware that the guest has been killed, but completely asynchronously. It's only the, ne the next time you'll try to do a BCP run hypercall that you will see, oh, well, this guest is gone, what, what, what's ha what happened? And it's way too late to actually you know, know why, why, why you've been killed. It makes things really hard to debug. All right, so coming back to our little guy here, um, the last thing we've done that we need to do is tear down the guest. We've created the guest, run, it, run the guest, and now we tear it down. The, um, the teardown procedure is, again, just the host issuing a hypercall to say, I no longer want to use that guest. The hypervisor has to do a few things before it can let that happen. One of them is check that there are no loaded vCPUs while, while this is happening. And then we need to take all of the pages that have been donated to the guest and return them back to the host so they can be freed into the memory management subsystem. Obviously, we need to poison the pages as we do that. Uh, because otherwise we might risk exposing uh, guest secrets that are, that are in those pages. As a reminder, ER2 is non-preemptible. So we just cannot do poison all of guest memory in one go and just like take minutes non-preemptible ER2. It's just not happening. So we have to do that in, in a slightly more complicated way. Um, so assuming that we have a system like this where we have Android and, and which is our host, I'm, I'm using Android as an example here, but the host, users, the host OS on the, on the left-hand side and the guest, and then uh, our host tries to tear down the, the, the guest. What will happen is the guest will notion, notionally disappear, but we will put the, the pages into a state which is host page pending recline. Um, and those pages still at that point have not been uh, touched by in any sort of way. And then we'll let the, 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 the host issue hypercalls to reclaim the pages one by one. When that happens, the hypervisor will, ha will map the pages using a fixed map, clear them, and then return them to the host, and so on and so forth, until everything has been reclaimed. Which means that we can reschedule between all of those hypercalls and make sure that we don't have a really long, um, non preemptible section. All right, that's uh, kind of the end of the, of the story here. Um, there are a lot of things that I have not talked about. Uh, there, is, you know, there, there, is, there is a lot more that I, there's just no time to talk about it. But obviously, there are, there are considerations around uh, talking to the secure world, uh, which is a big, sort of a big, big thing in, on the, in the ARM world. We need DMA protections. So we have IOMU support, uh, uh, some IOMUs into, into PKVM, Intel timers, power management, uh, TRNG, and there's probably a lot of other things that I just couldn't talk about. Um, and, and to finish, I uh, just wanted to, to mention a few limitations of the, of the past series that we have right now. So we are currently missing features, even for non-protected guests. So things such as dirty logging or, or read-only mem slots and things like that. We are working on all of those things. This is really things we intend to have, uh, to have fully, fully work, at the very least, for I mean, definitely for non-protected guests before we can learn this stuff. Uh, some of the other things we don't currently support is like huge, huge pages also very much uh, on the to-do list. Uh, we don't support k-exec uh, or, or things like device assignment yet. And with that, I will thank you all and open it up for questions. All right. <laughs> Could I ask the virtual questions first? Um, um, What's the plan to support SMMU in PKVM and how to manage the page ownership after SMMU? Yeah, so uh, we definitely plan to, to have SMMU support. Um, uh, there, there is some work that I know of that's ongoing to, to, get that, uh, to get that done. I'm not sure if anything has been posted on, on, on the list yet. But I would expect that to happen uh, eventually. Um, in terms of page ownership, the, the way, I mean, for the SMMU, it's relatively simple. We just do almost the same thing as we do for the host. Uh, we just have to, it, it also depends on whether or not we can handle uh, uh, SMMU faults directly at TL2. But uh, it's, it's, it's not fundamentally different. Every time we have to update the host page table, we would need to, have to go and walk the stage two page tables for the, the SMMU page table, sorry, and uh, update the page tables accordingly to, to match what we, we've done to the, to the, to the host. The other question is, is there any performance implication that the host now runs in a stage two translation just by this translation itself, and how noticeable is this? 
Yeah, so there is, uh, potentially, I mean, theoretically. The, the main overhead is, is going to come from, I mean, there are two things. It's going to be uh, uh, TLB pressure and the cost of TLB misses. Uh, but essentially, which is essentially, essentially the same thing. But yes, by having an, uh, an additional layer of translation, it means we, we you know, need to take more, we use more the TLBs, we put more pressure on the TLBs. Uh, one thing that's interesting to, to note, however, on that front is that the host owns the vast majority of memory and all the host mappings are identity mapped, which means we're in a position where we can very easily use really, really large block mappings to cover everything. So we can use gigabyte mappings to cover pretty much all of memory during boot, which makes the, the, the overhead of the, of the stage two practically impossible to, to actually measure. So, yeah. Okay, so I have a question. It seems like the teardown process has mm -hmm. some uh, overhead because you need to uh, do the, yeah, that's exactly that. Yeah. Uh, how much of a hover overhead is that? And have you considered doing that asynchronously? Uh, uh, well, so, so far it's, it's not been too big of a problem for us. And that's, I think that's mostly because, you know, this, the, the main users of this so far are like mobile use cases and we don't have extremely large machines with like terabytes of memory or something. It's like a gig. So it's not the end of the world. I think if we wanted to scale this, yes, then doing things asynchronously would be uh, would probably be a good idea. Yeah, because yes. that's what we're trying to do on S390 now. So. <laughs> right. Yes, well, I, I've seen your talk. It was quite yeah. interesting. So I think the, the idea of, of uh, just forking that and having a separate process to the cleanup for us to hide the latency to some degree, I think is, uh, would perfectly be applicable to this. And just a, a thing, another thing, which is like, I just want to understand something. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, it's like if the user uh, f um, from the QM console tries to like dump some memory from a secure guest, QM will die. Yes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Regarding his observation, that's why they are going to look into the private memory thing. And my question to you, if you could go also for the record a bit more in detail as to why you need the in-place conversion. Uh, okay, so the, the, um, one of the reasons why we're doing PKBM is, is to replace, uh, well, maybe not replace, but to to have a better way of, of doing something that we've been doing for, for many time, for, for many years. Uh, having things that run protected from the host kernel on a, on a phone is actually really old. We've been doing that for 15 years. And this is, it's the trust zone uh, story. So there's a lot of baggage there. We just have a ton of history. And transitioning pages to, to trust zone and having payloads that can, in some cases, use really large amounts of memory to deal with, I don't know, video playback, DRM use cases, you know, you can think of, of uh, you know, if you have like 4K video frames, you're not going to have megabytes, uh, you know, potentially it can be hundreds of megabytes of memory that are, that are going to be passed around between the host kernel and whatever is going to be handling that into that, that uh, sort of secure island, which is stress zone. If we want to have some of those stress zone workloads moved towards VM, we need to find an efficient way to have that zero copy sharing, like memory transfer happening between those two things. And this is why the, the in-place conversion stuff is, is necessary. Zero copy. Yeah. Yeah, so for the in-place in conversion, I think I have an idea that I'm like 95% will work with the unmapping guest private memory. With okay. the latest uh, proposal, it's a shim around um, Shmem from MemFD. And the yeah. way that works is that they just bury the uh, FOPs inside of another FOPs that doesn't wire up MemMap. Okay. And so I think what we can do is have KVM expose or rather extend its API for how the user space VMM says this is shared, this is private, this is whatever. Mm -hmm. And we can add a third flavor that says this is shared map or not shared. This is um, like user space mappable and only allow that when it's not mapped into the guest. And then we can mmap from inside KVM so that it doesn't require a mem slot update, so we avoid any SRCU pain. Then mm -hmm. you can do all of the filling from host user space, and then host user space can say convert in place, and if the underlying hypervisor allows that, so like TDXSE 
SNP don't allow that, but PKVM does, yep. then we can do an in-place conversion. We have to zero the memory, and it just naturally gets into the guest. So I'm like 95% certain that'll work. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear, honestly. I've, I've, I've seen patches floating around. I haven't time to, to actually look at them, but it's, it's, it's really, uh, really good to hear. Thanks. So I'm sorry, that's really a, a very basic question, but uh, since you have the owner ID only in the invalid PTEs, are there scenarios where you need to know the owner of a PTE uh, in a fault handler when it's valid, when it's actually mapped? Um, so if it's mapped into the host, it means that it has access to it, so we're not going to take a fault. If you have a, you know. I'm thinking about the case where uh, the guest would actually touch that page, but now it's mapped by the host. So why would that not? Is that part, is a scenario possible? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, can, can you maybe? So if the guest can can hit an invalid PT, the why can't it valid a, a valid PT? That's a question I have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. So we're, we're doing that, that game with the ownership ID only for the host stage two page table. Uh, every time we, we hit an invalid PT into, into the guest, we're not going to map some just some memory random pages into the guest. We'll have to have the host tell us this is the page that you can map into the guest at that, at that, IPA, at that IPA space. So, and then we'll have to do the checks that the host is actually allowed to donate that page to the guest, all that stuff. Oh, I think the, the key point there is the other the thing you said at some other place that the sharing is only between two entities, never yes. more. Okay. Uh, how do you attest to the guest? I'm guessing the host you attest through some bootloader stuff in Android, but what do you do about the guest payloads? Like the boot firmware and make sure that you have everything running right? Yeah, so the, 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 the bootloader stuff. So yeah, the idea is that the, the, the host doesn't actually see the bootloader from, from, from the guest. Uh, it's, the, it's the hypervisor that copies a trusted bootloader that was provided by the, you know, that was signed and whatever, that gets copied into the guest. And the host doesn't get involved into this at all. And then this, in, in our first implementation, we have something that's based on U-boot that, that has that. Uh, we'd like to rewrite that in some other language that's a bit more, a bit stronger. But uh, the idea is that we have the hypervisor copy the bootloader into the guest, force the guest to run that bootloader first, and then that bootloader will be in charge of receiving the guest payload through whatever mechanism it wants. In practice, for us, it's Vert.io, but it could just read it from guest memory directly, and then can measure the guest payload. And then that bootloader will have access to secrets that the host doesn't have access to in order to sort of derive a signed identity, enforceable identity for, for the guest, which the guest can then use to say, okay, I can, I can prove based on what the trusted bootloader has, has given me, I can prove that I am who I pretend to be. What's um, the root of trust for the trusted bootloader that gets shoved into the guest then? Sorry? How, do you, um, how does the hypervisor know that the bootloader is loading into the guest is actually trusted and correct? So the, the bootloader that gets loaded into the guest is uh, placed by the, the, the device bootloader in a memory carve-out, which we just take away from the host uh, beef, uh, really early during boot. So we unmap, if we have a memory region in physical memory where the bootloader dumps, you know, we dump the kernel image as well as the device bootloader and we just unmap that from the host. Recursively though, how, what's your end root of trust? Like, if you're using a DRM use case, Mm -hmm. And the whole point of that is someone doesn't want you decoding your video. How do you know that someone hasn't rooted your phone and is using PKVM to get at, and they've slightly modified things or something, and they're loading a so comprised? If you, yeah, so if you, the, the, the way uh, these things typically work, so I'm not, I'm not the best person to answer that question, I'll be, I'll be honest. Uh, but the way this typically works is if you root the device, the, the, the keys that the bootloader can use to sign whatever payload is done are, are removed. So we just wipe the keys when you root the device. Thanks. And that's also how, you know, you, you cannot just, um, you know, we, we will never provide 
a, a bootload, uh, that bootloader to non-protected guests, for instance, and just load the right payload, but in a non-protected guest, and just have you know the, the way the way this works is by just by just not providing the key when you can't, and that gets wiped when when the device is rooted. All right. Well, thank you very much.